Hello, everyone. We're not quite to the top of the hour yet, but I wanted to go ahead and open this up and welcome you to our webinar today. Uh, we will get started in just a moment. I want to allow some time for everyone to join us from the lobby. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started because we are right at the top of the hour. Welcome to the Rural Health Executive Educational Series. I am Cody Smith, Partnership Manager with NRHA Service Corps Creation, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today's presentation. Uh, before we dive in, please note there is a short survey at the end of the session, and if you could just take a minute to fill that out, we'd really appreciate it. Your feedback is invaluable in helping us to refine and tailor our future presentations to best serve your needs. Um, really quickly, I'll just go over a few housekeeping items. All attendees are muted during the session to avoid background noise. We do aim to wrap up the presentation in 45 minutes to allow for a Q&A session at the end. However, if you have a question for our presenter, please don't hesitate to put that into the question section of your webinar control panel at any time, and we'll be sure to address it. I suspect there will be a lot of questions today, so go ahead and get those in, um, and I'll start monitoring them so that we, we are sure we can address them all. Um, finally, I'd also like to remind you that this event is being recorded and you'll receive an email with a link to the recording uh, tomorrow. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from Amy Graham, Principal, and Ryan Brenneman, Consultant with Stroudwater Associates. Amy and Ryan are presenting Urgent Response, Navigating Rural Hospital Revenue Cycle During Change Healthcare Cyber Crisis. Uh, before we begin, I really quickly want to extend our sincere thanks to our dedicated partner, Stroudwater Associates. Amy, we are so grateful for your continued support and industry expertise, which allows us to host conferences, educational webinars, and other events that are dedicated to improving rural health care. Your support is crucial to our mission of advancing rural health initiatives. Okay, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Amy and Ryan for our feature presentation. Hey, thanks, Cody. Appreciate your time today and, and letting us just speak to this. Um, just to give you some background, my name is Amy Graham. My training is in accounting, but I have worked in revenue cycle for the past um, 20 years or so. And because of that, when this change healthcare cyber attack happened, my first question was, well, what about revenue cycle? Do people understand what that is, you know, what's happening out there? So that's what really stimulated this call happening because really i wanted to talk about why we're talking about this what it means for revenue cycle and then to help you all the the providers and the and the people who are just attending and wanting to know more about this as to figure out do you have a problem or not you may have already noticed you do have a problem or you may think mm, i'm in the clear not a pro not a nothing to worry about but i just want to really help you go through some of those things that's what ryan and i want to do and then give you some practical strategies that you can use today that help you through that if you thought about it and thought you yeah, still have a problem or oh maybe i do have a problem here to just actionable items that you can do in places that you can go so really to start off why am i talking about this today well as many of you know you may have been experienced this yourself at your hospital that healthcare cyber attacks have risen these breaches have risen 264 percent since 2019 and that was based off of incidents that have been reported to the office of civil rights there may be other incidences in which haven't been reported to the office of civil rights but just based on that number alone we are seeing an increase in this happening and in 2023, there were nearly 133 million individuals that were affected by breaches. I know I myself have actually received two letters from two different um, healthcare providers just saying, hey, your information may have been compromised in a breach that's out there. And when this happens, providers scramble for solutions. They're like, what do we do now? You know, how do we deal with our threat that happened to our organization if it was a breach on our data? or in the instance of change healthcare, when they reported this outside threat on February 21st, 2021, 
providers started really just scrambling for solutions. Like, how do we get through this? And so why is this an issue? Why did all of a sudden when I'm hearing about it, I'm going, oh, there's a problem here. Well, let's give you a little background into what's taking place. So Change Healthcare is a clearinghouse. That's like the pipeline that connects two different companies to one another. They are a clearinghouse. They were founded in 2007. And in 2014, they were acquired by Indion, another clearinghouse that was out there. And because Change Healthcare was the better known solution out there and had the better reputation, they kept that name. And then in 2016, they merged with McKesson's Information Technology Unit. You may have heard the name McKesson out there in the healthcare world. And then in 2022, that organization was acquired by United Health Group. Yes, the United Health Group that's out there and Optum. And so as part of that acquisition, what they did is they formed this big company, Change Healthcare operates under that Optum company. But there have been a lot of just organizations out there through acquisitions, as you can see, that have worked with each other. And these clearinghouses, as I said, it's the pipeline to the data. Insurance verification, it leaves your facility, it leaves the provider, and it goes via this pipeline to someone else. And then it comes back to you, that two-way communication. There are insurance claims when claims are being submitted. I remember when Medicare said, we're not going to accept paper claims anymore. We're only going to accept electronic claims. Then how do you get that information electronically through it? Through that pipeline. And insurance payments, what does that look like with those payments and that electronic information coming back and forth? And so when thinking about this, one of the things we went out and looked at is, are some change healthcare statistics. There are over a trillion dollars in healthcare claims that go out. That's one in five US patient records. There are 117,000 dentists, 2,100 payers that are connected, 800,000 physicians, 600 laboratories, and over 5,500 5, health systems. Nearly 15 billion, that's with a B, 15 billion pieces of information, transactions are going back and forth and through this, through all of the various change healthcare platforms. And so all of this informa information is connected to each other and those transactions are going somewhere. But then once this breach happened, it all came to a screeching halt. 15 million transactions, if that's in a year, that's about a billion in a month. And this, this breach happened on February 21st. So between February 21st, when the breach was identified, they immediately shut down their systems. They're like, okay, fine, shut them down. Because that's what I would have done. It's like, we've got to get this under control. And then, it, you know, it was reported out there that United Health did make a payment of $22 million. And that was in a Bitcoin equivalent. And there are a lot of articles out there that are talking about this payment that was made to recover access to the data in the systems. And then it was reported that pharmacy claims and processes were back online as of March the 7th. And then they had some dates floating out there. And initially when I put this presentation together, I'm like, yes, let's put the date out there. But there's still a TBD on the platform payment, the payment platform on when that's going to turn back on. And there's still a TBD on that reconnectivity on the claims platform. Now, I know I say these phrases and some of you may be like, okay, no big deal, platform turn back on, claims turn back on. What does that really mean for revenue cycle? So we've put together this schedule that just says, think about all of the activities because in revenue cycle if you've heard me present before you've probably seen this slide that talks about all of the activities there are activities that happen before the patient ever shows up before the patient even thinks about going to a provider that you've got era and edi enrollment provider credentialing you've got banking set up on where the payments are going to go because if you want to get paid the money's got to go somewhere that's to a bank 
You've got pre-activity, pre-visit activities before your patient ever shows up. Then they show up. And then once they do that, they submit the claims. The claims go out to the payer. Then you've got inbound processing where the payer responds and pays you back. And accounts receivable where you're just watching your AR. Did things get paid? Did things not get paid? But if you notice these items that are highlighted in the middle or highlighted in yellow, those are your clearinghouse activities, the, where a pipeline was needed and where the information goes through. And it's pretty interesting that when you look at this chart, it's like they took out the, the center of the, the columns that held it up. They just wept it out. It fell on the, you know, and, and there are breakdowns in that process. So if you think about all of these different activities, that can't take place because of things that have to go through a clearinghouse, whether that is change healthcare or another clearinghouse happening. Now, I know that when I talk about revenue cycle, that you know, most of you are hearing wah, 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 wah. You really, you know, how does that work? And when I and I talk to my family about it, they're like, Amy, stop talking about revenue cycle. And I'm like, but wait. Let me give you a non-healthcare example to set the stage. So my first one is gonna be, does anybody remember this guy? That was Mr. Zippy. Mr. Zippy was put into place in 1966 where you actually had to have an address. Your city, your street, your city, your state, your zip, right? Mr. Zip, you put a zip code on it. But what would happen if all of the sudden your zip code system stopped working. Oh, you could still get a mail there because you could look at saying, you know, we still have city and state, but all of those electronic resources to get that zip code that, you know, the zip code says, hey, this is my zip code. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. This is how you get there. This is my zip code to get it to, you know, Orlando, Florida. This is how we get there. We use that zip code. And if that happened, you'd have to have somebody manually go back and look at that letter and look at the city and look at the state and say, yes, it needs to go into this bin so that it makes it onto that truck to, or that airplane to get to Orlando, Florida. It could still go through, but somebody's got to touch it and work with it. And that's what's happened with this clearinghouse going down. Your mail would get delivered, but it's going to be delivered with delays. And when you think about what's happened in revenue cycle, that we have gone back 40 years. Now, <laughs> I laugh at the number of 40 years because we're going back to the way it was, not in the 50s and 60s, but to the way it was in the 80s and the 90s. Manual processes. We are back to those manual processes where people are having to go out and manually communicate from the payer or from the provider to the payer. You know, I heard some places they're like, yep, Amy, we pulled out a typewriter and we are putting it on the forms and we're getting that information. That's what's happened here is that the claims can still make it. This isn't a big denial issue. This is a delay. The mail has gone out the door, but it doesn't have a zip code on it. And so that really brings to light when this, when this zip code system would have gone down or when the change healthcare system went down, what happened was we started losing this disconnectivity because to bring it back to revenue cycle and why revenue cycle teams are going, holy cow, what do we do now? It's because you have your hospital claims, your outpatient clinic claims, your physician claims, and any provider claim that's going out there. It all goes to this clearinghouse. The clearinghouse electronically formats it in the format to go to the payer, and then the payer automatically formats it, sends, or sends it in their format back to the clearinghouse, who then sends it in a format that the hospitals, the outpatient centers, your physician claims can all receive. So that information is coming back to the clearinghouse, it's going back to the hospital claims, and it's like, hey, okay, I don't use change healthcare, that's not a big deal. But remember when I talked to you a minute ago and said United Healthcare, 
owns Change Healthcare now? Well, when United Healthcare started using Change Healthcare, they may not use your clearinghouse to send it back to you. They're sending it through a, a second clearinghouse. Because while there are other clearinghouses out there, there aren't many. But United Healthcare had made the change on some of their payments that they were sending it to this clearinghouse, the second clearinghouse, which then sends the payments back to you. So when you think about the payments coming back to you, it's like, oh, I might actually have a problem out here. And I know I've talked to some providers that said, yes, United Healthcare did say that we have a problem because they use Change Healthcare and they've been impacted by it. But you know what their option was? Is a physical check. And so when thinking about this physical check that's coming back to you, where are they mailing that check? Is it going back to your bank? Is it going back to your hospital address? If you have a centralized billing company, is it going to your centralized billing company who's got the information? Where is that check going? Because remember when I showed you that layout and one of my first items was banking setup? You've got it set up to where your payments come back electronically, they come back to you, they make it to your account, but what happens if they don't and they have to cut that physical check? Where does that go? I will tell you in my experience, there have been times that I've had a physician walk up to me and go, Amy, I got this check in the mail last night. Um, I'm pretty sure it belongs to the, you know, to the company, not to me because it's related to this date of service. So those are things to start looking out for to make sure that you're not losing those physical checks out there. Or if all of a sudden you had an office that has started receiving physical checks, how are you doing the deposits? Has the person who does the deposits all of a sudden you're getting, they went from getting two or three checks a week or you know, two or three checks a month, a few payments here, a few payments there to now they're getting 30 checks? Are you getting one check for everybody or are you getting one check per patient or are you getting one check for an entire date of service? Those are the questions you now have. So Ryan, I'm gonna hand it over to you and let you help us understand how do we know if we have a problem or not. Are you there, Ryan? Well, it doesn't Let sound like Ryan. He is still there, but he might be having some um, audio, audio difficulties. Issues, so. Yeah, you I'll know what? check in with him, Amy. <laughs> and I'll keep I'll cover for him keep going so all right so one of so things to review when when looking at your revenue cycle activities the first thing you want to do is start asking questions so remember when I started talking about these areas then the first thing I would ask is does your clearinghouse use change? Does your facility, do you use change healthcare as your clearinghouse? And if the answer is no, when you're sitting there thinking, ah, oh, life is grand, we don't use change healthcare, we use somebody else, I would still go back and ask some questions. Things like, um, so, you know, ask the questions of, you know, can I still perform insurance verification? You know, can you do that? Can you not? Um, you know, can you do those type of things? If not, you need to go back and say, okay, who's missing? Who can I do prior authorizations for? Um, you know, what are you doing to do these tasks? Yes, I can still do prior authorizations, but instead of being able to use this portal that the payer set up, we've now got to pick up the phone and wait on hold. And then maybe you can't do it at all. That's their only one-way channel in. Well, if it's only one-way channel in, it could be there is a risk out there that you're not getting your prior authorizations done. Has your payer put them on hold? Have they not? What does that look like? 
And then, you know, so that takes care of prior authorizations and insurance verification, you know, those type of things. I know I talked to some facilities and when they were talking about this insurance verification, they're like, how do we do copays and deductibles? We can't get real time information like we used to. It, you know, some of the discussions I've had with them are, you know, what does that look like? Can you, you know, can you get them manually? Maybe you just take a portion of what you think it should be, but then make sure you've got a robust refund process at the end and to be able to capture it. Another question to think about if you don't use Change Healthcare, so you think you're okay, go back and go, go back and make sure that you've confirmed that, that the released batches. So go talk to, you've really got to go talk to your revenue cycle team and say, can we confirm that we've released it? Yes, we've confirmed that we've released them. They are no longer in our systems. We don't have access to them anymore. We can't see them. They appear to be billed. Well, then what you're going to want to do is go back and go back and see if, yes, they've been released to the payer, but did the payer confirm the receipt of the claims? Go back today and say, yes, we've released the claims, and yes, we can see they're on file. It's been about 30 days, so it's been a little over 30 days now since this breach happened and everything occurred. So you have time to be, you know, you can go back and see in their system and go, yes, my number one payer, we can confirm they've received those claims. Okay, cool. That's great. Then go back. The another question to ask is thinking about cash. You know, I said there was that second a clearinghouse to come through. With that second clearinghouse that's come through, you know, is cash being deposited from every payer in the manner that you expect? Or are there payers who have changed their processes? You know, you, you know, are you missing payments out there that you call in and it's like, yes, we issued the check on, um, we issued the check on March the 10th. And it's like, well, where is the check? How did you issue it? Where did you send it? You know, what's been changed? Who's missing? You know, how have they, if you're missing payments, going back to the payer and saying, what has changed? And also look at you've received communication from the payer. Talking to the providers that I know, um, they are saying that they have received a letter. They've received several communications from United Healthcare, keeping them abreast of the situation going on. And there are other payers that are following suit to say, here's how we are handling it, or no, this did not impact our processes. Look for that communication, see if it's out there, and really pay attention to it. It could be that sitting in that letter, sitting over to the side that, you know, it's just sitting on somebody's desk and you may want to go look at it and see what that communication actually says to you. And then also, you know, do you have a process in place to post and deposit the payments? If you have a centralized billing process, does that centralized billing process, you know, it was putting money to a lockbox somewhere. It was going automatically. You didn't have to worry about it. But now that you're getting these physical checks, those physical checks don't go to your centralized business office. They're coming to you. And do you have a way to, to just work with them and see, you know, if you can, if that information is out there and what that looks like and how are you capturing it and having those discussions? And then the final thing I would say is, if the answer is no, you don't use Change Healthcare as your clearinghouse, just ask, has anything else changed in the past few days? Don't, don't just assume that everything is great. Go back and say, has anything else changed? And listen to what the answer is. Because a lot of times I've caught myself in this, I catch myself in this all the time, where I say things and I'm like, wait, did what I say make sense? Did, you know, repeat back to me what I have just heard or what you've heard me say. Go back to your team and actually say to them, repeat back to me what you have heard me say and what does that look like? Um, or what does that sound like? And does that make sense when they repeat it back to you to make sure you're on the same page? 
because you could be you could ask a question of going are we getting payments from everybody and they'll come back and they'll go yes we're getting payments from everybody but what they didn't tell you is they're getting payments from everybody but they're having to spend 20 minutes pulling this EOB from the manual site and making it sure that it matches to the bank and the information that's in your bank account. And that's actually added manual steps to it and manual processes. Because what I will tell you is your revenue cycle teams, they are busting their humps right now to try and figure out how to get the money into your bank account and get the money posted against their AR. That is what we do as revenue cycle members. We want to get the money into onto the patient's account and get that AR cleared so we don't need to work, worry about it anymore. And so you want to make sure that your team is just looking at that and pay, you know, looking at that and paying attention to it. And that if they've done anything to just manually make it work and they go, well, we have seen a little increase in this, dig into that a little more. Because, and then if they come back and they've answered, nope, there's not been a problem with any of these and you're fine and dandy, then here's what I would say. Don't change anything. <laughs> Leave it as it is and be thankful because there's someone out there that, you know, they've been impacted and it's really rocked their world pretty, pretty hard. So when doing it, because here's the next one. Do you use change healthcare as your clearinghouse? And the answer is yes. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. And I just have to breathe heavy because, man, if you're using Change Healthcare as your clearinghouse, the first question you've got to find out is what activities are broken and detail out each of these indiv activities individually. Because if your insurance verification, things that we've learned through this process is that Change Healthcare has different systems, different pipelines out there that take care of the insurance verification, they're taking care of the coding, they take care of the payment posting, they take care, you know, claims acceptance and provider posting. Those are all different pipelines. So you want to make sure that you're detailing out all of these activities individually and, and attacking them. And then also, what's happening in the meantime? You know, who's responsible for it? What are they doing? Because I've talked to one in the hospital and they're like, oh, Amy, we knew before change knew that the system was gonna, that was the system was broken. And it's like, you know, okay, system's broken. What are we gonna do? And they were jumping on submitting manual claims to their payers. They were finding alternate websites to do it. But what I would say is find the person that is um, that is responsible for the task or make somebody responsible for the task. So they're not just thinking that, hey, I'm doing it, but no, Ryan's doing it, but no, you know, that type of thing. And Ryan, are you back with me? I think you might be. Oh, doesn't sound like you're off of mute yet. Well, well <laughs> <I'll>, <laughs> and we are troubleshooting. <laughs> Okay, I you know, it was like I wondered if he was back in line, but you know what? So this is one of those things. It's like, okay, who's responsible for it? And if the person's responsible for it or not responsible for it, you know, what if they're on vacation or what if like in this situation that we've got a technology problem and you get to listen to me the whole time instead of me and Ryan together. But, you know, who's responsible for it and what are you doing with those activities that are broken? You really want to look at, are any activities working as designed? There are some functions out there that the pipeline is still broke, it's still open. And it's like, if that's the case, don't mess with anything. Don't change it, say thank you, mark it off your list, and let's go to the next one. The next one is, is cash being deposited from any payer or in the manner that they expected? Very similar to the no, you know, these are very, almost the same as the no options because that's the clearinghouse. Maybe they use a totally different clearinghouse to get the payments to you. That is great, you know, or do they use the second clearinghouse and that second clearinghouse sends it to change and then change sends you that information. What's going on? I hear, you know, there are a lot of workarounds that are in place 
And what does that look like? How is that information making it to you? Making sure that you get um, that you get that information and that you have it in control and you just understand what's happening. Because here's what I will say, the last one, has the team put any manual workarounds into place? I've talked to several teams and they're like, yep, we went out, we now go out and we get the EOB instead of having it delivered to our inbox every day. We go pull it, we bring it and we get it in and we get it posted. But the one thing I would ask is, what, how has this impacted their workload? Because I will tell you, probably takes a little longer to go out to that website and bring it into their system and then convert it so that it can be loaded up into your AR system than it does to just get an email and a bot's going out there and grabbing your email and uploading it every day. What is that manual workaround and what has that done to the workload of the team? And then, you know, what delay is this causing in addition to the change healthcare delays? If your claims can't, you know, if your claims can't be submitted, well, what is that delay doing to it? What's that downstream impact? Um, you know, have they, you know, if it's interesting, another hospital I talked to, they're like, yep, we loaded up on the system and we're getting it. And you know what we found? We're actually getting a quicker response time from the payer than we did from Change Healthcare. And so it's like, oh, take that one with you when you talk to Change Healthcare the next time after all the dust is settled and go back and say, why is it that I can get a response from the payer in less than two hours, but for you, it takes 24 hours to get the response back. Those are the delays that, you know, to work on it and, and just figure that out because there, I am positive that for some of you, and I feel for you so much, that there are stacks of paper, stacks of, you know, just claims and, and, and accounts and charts that haven't been released from your system. They're sitting out there and, you know, are just building up. And when they're building up, it's, you know, it's just adding to the stress that they're feeling because they like their desk to be clean and their desk can't be clean because they've got this stack of paper that, you know, I can't get the coding to release it so I can get the claims out the door because coding uses a change healthcare encoder to use it, or they're using a, you know, just different aspects within that system. And then the final thing, again, like if the answer was no, is there anything else that has changed since February 1st, 21st of 2024? That was when that was when the impact occurred at Change Healthcare. They shut their systems down. They shut off all access to their systems. And that's when the backload started occurring. That's when the water stopped flowing all the way through. It turned from being a rushing river to being just a trickle. And what does that look like? And what, how are your teams addressing it and staying on top of it? Now, we've talked about the questions to identify if you've got a problem. Let's talk about your KPIs. So I'm going to go off and, and talk about what is a KPI. A KPI is a key performance indicator. It's a measure of a specific item over time. And we show you here like where, we're, where we have an example of we're looking at charges, payments, adjustments, and denials. And what it does is it helps you measure the financial health of your organization. And these KPIs are tied to a business goal. The thing to think about with KPIs is that they're actionable, directionable, accurate, and measurable. And this measurable, when you think about the items that would be measured on a KPI, you know, you've been tracking it for a while, looking at, you know, over a specific a specific time period, looking at that and just a dashboard for what your the health looks like for your organization. And with this KPI dashboard, in looking at it, you've got, you know, a sample of it. Some of you may have some out there and some others. You know, it doesn't have to look specifically like that. But one of the things that you want to make sure of 
is that you looking at the key ones of your cash goal, you, you know, your cash collections. What are your cash collections looking like? You can see on this example that I have a DNFB and a DNFC. That means discharged, not final build, and discharged, um, not final, uh, final, oh, oh man, my brain, it just left me. Um, it's not final build and not final close, I believe. Oh man, for the revenue cycle people in the house, you know, when you just lose that that acronym and what it means. <laughs> but in looking at it, these two factors are really important to pay attention to because if you are submitting claims and you can't get them billed, then I'm expecting that your DNFB, that final build number is continuing to grow, go up. And if it's not going up, then, and you do use change healthcare, then I would go back to look at that metric to figure out what is happening, you know, why is that number not, go not going up and what's occurring within it. Now within this cyber attacks, this, you know, with change healthcare going down, either yes or no, another way to look at it is to compare, take your KPI data, take that information and break it down into what is your daily rate? Because we're 30 days in, but you know what we haven't had yet? This is for all my finance people in the house. You really haven't had a full month in close process yet where you go pull the AR reports to see what the difference is between the end of February and the end of March, because you really only had seven days worth of activity from February 1st, I mean, eight days activities from February 21st to February 29th that you close the month. You may not have seen it change too much, but I will tell you that between February, between March 1st and March 31st, you're gonna have 31 days that if change healthcare doesn't come back on, and even if it does, pretty sure you're not gonna be caught up that quickly, but in looking at these different factors. So go back to you know your claims submitted, claims accepted, go back to say no, Q4 of last year, that's calendar quarter of last year, and look at what your volume is on a daily basis. So take a 90 day period prior to February, go back and say, how many claims did we submit on a day? Did we submit 100 claims a day? Okay, if we submitted 100 claims a day, how many are we submitting now? Or even from February 21st to now, that if you take 26 plus nine, that's 35 days. Have you submitted 3,500 claims since then? Have those claims been accepted? What that means is, has the payer said, yes, we've accepted, that average daily rate of claims that you see that coming back. Do you have rejected claims out there? Chances are that you, you know, if you don't use change healthcare and they do use change healthcare, you might have some claims that are rejected. And rejected is different from denied claims. This is claims that <laughs> rejected, uh, you know, it doesn't even make it in the front door of the payer. They rejected it back to you. Look at your pre-registration rates because there are tools that you may have used as part of Change Healthcare. What is that daily rate related to it? And cash collections. Now, I will say for the finance people in the house, you probably were monitoring your cash collections and you can see that your daily rate has gone down and you're like, where's the cash and what do we do? But really calculate that daily rate. How much did you get on average? It's not gonna be exact. Um, because there are fluctuations when those checks make it to you, when the payers are making the payments. But on an average, you could come back and go, 30, you know, 35 days worth of cash should have been this. Did we get those 35 days of cash in the door? Because in monitoring those items, these are the five key items that I would look at to develop that, that rate to understand what the financial impact is for you. And if you're in revenue cycle, calculate these rates and then go have that conversation with the person who manages the general ledger and say, hey, Amy told me to calculate these for you. Is this helpful? You know, and for the for the accountants in the group to come back and go, yep, I needed that because you can do an accrual to get it on your books, right? Doesn't put the cash in the bank, but 
Your financial statements will look good. Okay, that was the accountant talking. Now back to revenue cycle person. But just realizing though, that for every one of these numbers that is trending off, that that is an impact to the workload that your team is dealing with. So that gets me to practical strategies for today, which is probably why a lot of you are attending the call. And what can we do today to help get through this situation? Well, I will say that um, uh, um, Secretary Becerra did a presentation to the um, Health and Human Services, who's over Health and Human Services, did it to the Finance Subcommittee at a meeting. And he says, we are saying to the payers, you need to start making payments because while you may not receive the actual bill, you have a general sense on a monthly basis what these providers bill you. So there's no reason to not work out advanced payments to these hospitals because you know what they've done? They have a KPI that says, here is provider A. Provider A normally sends me $100, you know, $1,000 a month in claims. I haven't gotten any in the past 35 days. Maybe I should make an accrual for that. They're doing it on the other side. And so they are saying that these payers need to make, you know, that they need to start making payments to the providers. So based on that and this information, you can reach out to your payers. So let's talk about Medicare first. I split it between Medicare and other payers. Medicare. Medicare does have, um, you can apply to your Medicare administrative contractor, that's your MAC, for these accelerated payers. You don't go straight to CMS, you'll go to your Medicare contractor, and you know, if, um, that would be like Meridian, NGS, Palmetto, those places, to apply for accelerated payments. And you use that KPI trend that you had calculated based on, here's how many claims we normally submit, here's a dollar value of them, and based on those claims that we normally submit, here, you know, this is what we could expect in payments. And there is, I've actually provided a link here, and there's a link at the end of the presentation that shows you, gives you a link to the instructions on how to fill out that change healthcare, optum, payment disruption, accelerated payments to Part A providers, and advanced payments to Part B suppliers. So if you bill to Part A or you bill to Part B, there are instructions, the link is there. You can go out and say, Here's what I trend. This is what I see that I'm missing. Here's where it is. And have that discussion. UHC has also provided uh, uh, temporary funding assistance as well. Um, that link is on another on our final appendix slide in the deck to do it. Then um, the Association for Community Affiliated Plans, ACAP, has listed their plans messaging so they have individual plans underneath them and resources related to it. I would say to reach out, the another item, another area to reach out is to reach out to your state's hospital association and learn about activities they are pursuing because your hospital association has, is representing the hospitals in your state saying, how are you going to make these payments to our providers? Our, you know, you've got the money, <laughs> you've been paid the premium, the premium system didn't go down, what do you, do? you know, how can you do that? And then also, contact your payers directly. And when you're contacting your payers directly, find out from them, how can I get my claims to you? How can I prior author, you know, get my prior authorization? What do I need to do to find out if they're eligible for this or not? Reach out to your payers directly. Find your top five payers. You don't have to go to all 500 that are in your payer dictionary or 5,000 that are in your payer dictionary. Go look at your top five and see if there are ways to seek alternative claim submission methods. Ask them what they are doing because United Healthcare, they sent the letters out. They're mailing paper checks. What are they do? You know, what are your other payers doing? Have they begun mailing paper checks? And if so, where are the payments going? What does that look like? And then again, share your findings from your KPI trends. Go, here's what I'm missing. Now, if you can see my hands, I didn't turn my camera off, but if you can see my hands, I'm pointing to a piece of paper going, 
here's what my KPIs say. This is what I bill you on a monthly basis. This is how much you pay me on a monthly basis. I need this money. Let's figure something out. And then, you know, and they may say, well, it's going to be a low. It's like, you know, yes, when you get those claims submitted, they'll offset the payments against it. But that's not happening today. That system, I looked at it before I got on this call, that system is not working today. So, you know, have those discussions with the payers and say, it's been 35 days. I need my money now. And then also focus on today. What can you do today is focus on today. Don't panic because it's not a denial problem. It's just a delay. Thinking back to our first qu our first example of, hey, the zip code's down. It's like the mail's been mailed. It's just it hasn't been delivered yet. The claims are there. Keep doing the basics. Do your activities to keep your doors open and your lights on. Do the basics. And then listen, go have that conversation with your revenue cycle team and listen to what they are saying. And then, you know, most revenue cycle teams understand at a very high level what has happened. They know what's impacted their job, what they can and cannot do. And so you want to stay, stay there, but realize that their automated processes have been disrupted. So their workloads have increased. Instead of being able to just send it through a machine and have it go to the right truck to get that mail to Orlando, they're having to physically walk that, you know, if the zip code system, going back to that, walk that over and do it. And I will tell you, I have yet to meet a revenue cycle team that doesn't care about the job they do. And I will tell you, most of them fight for every nickel, every penny that you, that you are owed for the services that you provide. And this impact with change healthcare is causing them additional stress. They may not come and say to you, I'm about to you know, have a breakdown because I can't do my job. Or maybe they're saying that to you and really listen to what they are saying and say thank you to them. And they acknowledge that you realize that their processes have changed and that you will work as an organization together and support them on that. And then continue to ask the questions. Have you received those communications? What else have you noticed that's broken? What's, what other changes? And listen to what they say and ask the questions and help understand. Because while they may understand what's going on, they may not necessarily be able to articulate to you what is, you know, in the way that you need to hear it. It's very similar to like Spanish and Portuguese. They both sound very similar to each other, but when you try and talk to each other, sometimes you need an interpreter or you need to go hear this word and this is how it translates over and to listen to them because they can't do their job in the way that they were accustomed to doing it. And if they are able to do their job in the way they are accustomed to do it, celebrate, just celebrate that little fact because it really is an impact out there. And then what you need to start doing is prepare. Prepare for when change is back online. Because once it gets online, are you going to, you know, get that reporting cadence from your each individual areas? Are your areas able, you know, once they turn it back on, change isn't going to be able to take $15 billion, trans, 15 billion trans, or 15 billion transactions going through in a month, in a day. There's going to have to be a ramp up because if you send them all through, chances are there's going to be a backup, you know, once it gets into their systems. But what you want to do is you want to monitor your workflows, make sure that everything's been submitted that needs to be submitted. You're working that claim acknowledgement where the payer says, yep, we got it. We're working it. It's here. And then start reviewing claims and rejected reports to make sure that everything make that everything um, that you received has been, re everything you've submitted has been received, and then start monitoring rejections to see if you can find root causes. Was it from a particular day where they were submitted and coming back? And then the last thing I will say is monitor. Monitor, monitor your AR. Everything from Q1 2024, do not allow it to age out greater than 60 days without someone manually reviewing those claims. 
you want to make sure that you are looking at it because most payers will make a payment to you within 60 days. And so, you know, you'll start to see it pretty quickly because now we're into 35 days of change healthcare being down and you're, you're going to start to see your accounts receivable grow because you've got it out of your system or out of your internal systems, but it's not made it to the payer yet. And so make sure that you are not allowing it to age greater than 60 days without performing that manual review. Now, Cody, I know I went about four minutes over to open it up. Look, we provided some QR codes, but you wanna open it up for some questions and, and share those with us? Absolutely, I've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, I do wanna just say, and Amy just mentioned it, there's the QR codes, please take advantage of those, get this contact information and reach out. Amy and Ryan are a wealth of knowledge and um, I know personally just from working with them through NRHA that they are always, always happy to chat um, and we'll answer any questions that you have. So we'll go ahead and launch into the questions. Remember, if you have those, go ahead and put them into the control panel at any time. We'll start off with Amy, is it safe at this time to access the Optum EDI to review claims denials if no is it safe to view denials in optum ied i e d i <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah so what i would say is yes i if there is is if there were a secure site out there a more secure site out there it's going to be your optum edi site so it, there is so much attention being placed on that security right now that if you can get into the system then you can um, believe, you know, you can trust that it should be relatively secure. Now, I say that, um, I, I say that from the standpoint of, I'm making that assumption, but you know, there is so much focus on change healthcare right now and all of that security, it was $22 million. I'm pretty sure I'd put my resources on that too. That's, I, I feel very confident in that. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question, we have received a $3,500 check, but are unable to get the EOB for LASSO. Uh, called Change Healthcare, and they are unable to help me. Do you have any suggestions? Okay, so my first question is, is LASSO a payer? If LASSO is the payer, then call the payer directly. They just go, I've got a check, and maybe even go to their accounting department. If LASSO is a system within Change Healthcare that I'm not familiar with, then what you're going to do is find out who that payer is and call the payer and be like, I've got a check. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. First thing I do, put that check in the bank. Keep the money. Okay, you can always refund it later, but put the check in the bank and make interest off of it, right? And then contact the payer. Keep it out there as an unapplied cash. Contact the payer. Find out if they can give you an EOB for it, if they can give you a date of service range related to it, if you can tie back a group of claims related to it. First thing I would say is deposit the check, reach out to the payer, change healthcare. No, they're not going to be able to, because if you think about it, they're a pipeline. They're not the payer. They're the zip code. They're not the city state. Great, thank you. Next question. Well, another question. Yeah, next question. When change healthcare is back online, will we receive the electronic permits that we should have received during the time the system was down? If we are retrieving and posting the EOBs, do we need to be concerned with duplicate posting problems? I, so I don't know how they're going to handle the e, the electronic remits that should have come down. I've not seen anything on that right now. Uh, if I would say yes, I would be cautious, not concerned. I would be cautious about duplicate posting. So once Change Healthcare comes back online, before you post anything, make sure that you are reviewing what's in that file. And, and then once you post those first few files back from Change Healthcare, then continue monitoring it. But you bring up a good point. You also, I didn't really mention it in this, but your refund team and your credit balances, that's another area that once Change comes back online, that you're going to want to monitor your credit balances to make sure that you haven't duplicate posted them or over contractualized them. And instead of it, before you issue a refund, make sure that it isn't really a journal entry that needs to be done in your system. All right, thank you so much, Amy. I don't have any other questions that are in the Q&A right now. Um, I will open it up, just to remind you, take advantage of this time. 
with our experts. I think I just had one comment. Let me check. Yeah. Is there any resource yeah. that lists all payers impacted by the change breach? Uh, we're struggling to identify every payer as we're seeing impacts from payers that were not identified by our clearinghouse. No, not that I've seen. I hate that answer. I hate that answer so much, but it each each payer in and of themselves is exactly that. It's like if you've seen one payer, you've seen one payer. And I apologize. I don't know of any resource that lists all the payers. Um, and that would sort of be like Change Healthcare listing their client list. And I don't foresee that happening either. Um, and that's one of those that you're struggling to identify every payer. I get that. That's where you start going back and looking at what your KPI trends look like and things like that. And and I know that when you contact the payers, you know, calling the payers, they don't have a clue either. You know, you're you, sometimes they have a clue and sometimes they don't. Some are very active, some aren't. Um, and even the same payer in different states operates differently. And that is very frustrating. And so, um, you know, I, I, I do just, I, I am sorry. And I thank you for the work you're doing. If no one else tells you, thank you. I tell you, thank you, because it is a very frustrating time in revenue cycle. Um, and, you know, if you want to call somebody and vent to them, just so you have somebody who understands what you're talking about, other than your family, feel free to reach out. <laughs> My family appreciates it too. So, um, and actually, I see a comment came through that said somebody um, got a, a list last week. And so if that comes out and it has that list, we'll definitely get it shared with you. So, Cody, I'll, I'll share that with you if it comes in. So thank you if you yeah. do have those resources. And that's what I would say is we are a community. We understand, you know, a community of revenue cycle people who understand it um, and are experiencing this in a different way than the IT programmers who are worried about the breaches. We, you know, revenue cycle is worried about it, but from a totally different angle. And I appreciate the cybersecurity people who are all on that. Thank you for the job you're doing. Um, to keep the enemies out of our gates. Great, thank you so much, Amy. Um, I will turn it back over to you for any closing remarks and then I will close us out for the afternoon. If you do have any questions, we do have a couple more minutes. So don't hesitate to put those in. We can always address them. Or if I don't get a chance to get to them, um, I'll make sure Amy gets them. Yeah, so here's some helpful links um, on it. These were the ones that I had as of um, the time of getting this deck together and making sure that there weren't many typos in it and things like that. I have checked all the links and uh, they do work. If you find a problem, let me know. And then if you have any to add to it, um, more than happy to add them and distribute that information out as well. And I just wanna say again, thank you. It, it is a trying time for both the accounting people because they're like, want to get your financials right. For providers, you want to pay the bills and and have the money in the account and your money's not there. And what do we do? Um, happy to, you know, just help and listen and um, just know that as we hear things, more than happy to share it and get it out there. But Cody, again, NRHA, I appreciate the fact that I sent a note and just said, Hey, has anybody thought about this impact? And you all were very quick to uh, change the content of a, another webinar that we were doing and say, yep, we can put this one in and slot it in its place. So thank you for your flexibility on that and for us to be able to do it. So that's all I have today. Thank you so much, Amy. And we're always happy uh, to share information with our rural health care community. Like you said, we are a community and we're here for each other. And this was such important information. I thank everyone for joining us today, uh, spending your time here. Again, make sure if you have any other questions you haven't asked yet, don't be shy. I know Amy's happy to answer them. You can reach out to me as well, um, and I'll make sure Amy gets any questions. There is a recording that will come out tomorrow. Um, there'll be a link, and then this recording does live live on this page for a year, so you can refer to it anytime if you have questions. Uh, again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to take care of that survey at the end. Be safe and have a wonderful Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday. It is. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Cody.